Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. On today's episode, we're going to learn about the movie Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Released in 1993, Dragon is often referred to as one of the most popular biopics about the life of Bruce Lee. But how accurate is it? Well, that's what we're here to find out, and to help us separate fact from fiction, I'm joined today by author Matthew Pauly. His book is called Bruce Lee, A Life, and is considered by many to be the most authoritative biography on the life of Bruce Lee. Before we chat with Matthew, though, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means that one of them is an all-out lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Bruce Lee was born in the United States. Number two, Bruce Lee did not dictate his book on Jeet Kune Do to his wife, Linda. Number three, Bruce Lee left Hollywood because of racism he faced when he was passed over for a TV show called Kung Fu that he helped write. Got him? Okay, now, as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and then by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to get Matthew on the line to chat about the historical accuracy of the movie Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. The movie starts off in Hong Kong in 1949. Since we know from history that Bruce Lee was born on November 27th, 1940, we can assume he's eight or nine, depending on when in 1949 this is happening in the movie. But almost right away, we see the young Bruce Lee start training one-on-one with Yip Man. Can you give us some background on Bruce Lee as a child and when he started training with Yip Man like we see in the movie? Sure. But first, I just want to correct one thing that really annoys me about the first part of this movie and annoyed the Lee family, which is that he wasn't an only child living alone with his father. He had a mother, he had three older siblings and a younger brother. So they were a a big family. And so this movie depicts him as almost being, you know, an orphan child with just a father around. So that's the first thing that they, uh, for some odd reason, decided to do. The second thing was, yeah, Ip Man, he didn't begin formal study of martial arts under Ip Man as his master until he was 16 years old. So they pushed this up very early. It's fine that they did that. As far as Hollywood biopics go, this isn't the worst poetic license that they took. But no, he the reason he started studying Kung Fu was actually because he was in a gang, like kind of a middle class gang. They weren't like selling drugs or anything. But he loved getting into fights. And so they would go around and start trouble on the streets of Hong Kong, which back in the 1950s was a much rougher place than it is today. And he met this older boy by the name of William Chung, who was a better fighter than he was. And Bruce was so competitive, he hated the idea anyone was better. So he wanted to see why. And the reason was because William Chung was studying Wing Chung under Ip Man. And so Bruce Lee said, hey, can I learn with you? And he went to Ip Man and Wang Shunlong, who was Ip Man's senior student. And he said, I want to study with you. How long before I can beat up William Chung? So his purpose in studying Wing Chun was not to like protect himself from bullies. It was to become a better street fighter. So it had nothing to do with uh, in the movie. It's like his father is the one that leads him there and holds his hand to the training. So not that at all. Not that at all. In fact, so what is interesting is when Bruce was seven or eight, his father tried to teach him Tai Chi because Bruce was a hyperactive kid. I joked that if he'd been born later, they'd have put him on Ritalin. So Bruce didn't like Tai Chi because it was for old people. And in fact, when he went to study Wing Chun, he didn't tell his father because his father was so upset with him already for getting into all these fights. And so he kept it a secret. And when his father found out he was studying Wing Chun, he was furious. So it's the complete opposite of how they told it in the story. Sounds sounds a little different. (laughs) Right. Now, you mentioned uh, getting into a fight, and that leads into the next question, because according to the movie, this is, I think, 1961. 
there's a fight and a scene that the text on the screen tells us it's at the Lantern Festival. And there's some soldiers there. Uh, one of them happens to be the nephew of the assistant police inspector of Kowloon. And Bruce gets into this fight with them. He ends up sending this sailor to the hospital with a punctured lung after getting into the fight. And this is when Bruce's dad, and it's it's interesting you mentioned that there's no other family around because, yeah, again, you don't see anybody else. It's just him and his dad there talking. And he tells Bruce that he has to leave Hong Kong. And this is when we see, he takes Bruce to this like secret room or secret area. And, oh, here's a birth certificate. Your name is Bruce Lee. And you have to go to America now. That's right. Yeah, I should say he mentions that he was on tour there with the uh, Canton Opera Company in 1940. So is that why Bruce Lee left Hong Kong to go to America? Uh, so that again, what they do a lot in this movie is they take some elements that are true and then they stretch it to the point of breaking and then they kind of put it back together. So Bruce's father did tour with a Cantonese opera troupe in America in 1940 and Bruce was born there. So he was an American citizen. He knew that before before the great reveal, but they, you know, they didn't make a big deal. It didn't matter to him. He didn't think about it very much. What had happened was that Bruce Lee, after he started studying Wing Chun, wanted to go learn how to be better at it. And so he would go on the streets of Hong Kong and bump into people. And if they got angry, then he'd start a fight with them. And so he was basically this punk who was like starting fights with people to show how good he was and also to practice and get better. And one day he bumped into this Chinese teenage kid and the kid fought back and he beat him up. And the kid's father was an important person. And that kid's father went to the police. He didn't fight any British soldiers um, at a lantern festival and beat up five of them doing acrobatics, which, by the way, he didn't know how to do acrobatics. Ripping his shirt off in the process. You yes. that. <laughs> yeah, he ripped his shirt off and did the, like several backflips. So that was like Jackie Chan. Bruce Lee was a Wing Chun guy and they didn't do flips. But anyway, so he didn't fight white guys. It was some Chinese kid from an important family. So the police had heard about Bruce. He had been in so many street fights that his name was on a list. And so finally, the police went around to his parents and to his mother, actually, and said, if you don't straighten him out, we're going to have to arrest him. And that's when they had the conversation, which you see in the movie. But it was the mother and father saying, look, things aren't going well. Bruce was failing out of high school. Um, it didn't look like he had any job prospects. So they said, why don't you go to America and straighten yourself out? And so that aspect is true, but uh, through the distortion of uh, Hollywood magic. Why go to America then? Because in the movie, it's like, oh, you love American cars. You love American things. So obviously America is is where you're going to go. It was America because he had an American passport. And so that was somewhere he could go. But also there was another reason, which was at that time, Every American male of 18 years of age had to sign up for the draft. It was a law. And so if Bruce Lee didn't sign up for the draft, his American citizenship could be revoked. And so they also wanted to make sure that he secured this because for people living in Hong Kong, which at that time was very third world, an American's birth certificate, a citizenship, had great value. And so if he secured that, then the family could theoretically move to America with him. And so this was something they didn't want to lose. Ah, OK. Yeah. The movie doesn't mention any of that side of it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Well, once Bruce arrives in America in the movie, he's in San Francisco and we see him as a dishwasher in a restaurant called Gussie Yang's. Almost right away, he attracts the attention of a waitress named April which then leads to a fight, another fight where he's outnumbered with the cooks there, led by someone named Mr. Ho. Of course, Bruce is a much better fighter than the cooks, so he defeats them pretty easily. But Miss Yang gets upset, fires Bruce, but then gives him two weeks pay, two weeks severance on top of that, and then hands him some extra money as a loan. She suggests that either he can just go blow his money and then wind up there as a, a dishwasher. I think she says something to the effect of, I can always use a good dishwasher, or he should go get an education. Now, if we're to believe the movie, Bruce seems to go to America and then get in trouble right away. <laughs> Is any of that true? 
<laughs> so one thing I do like about that scene is the uh, owner of the restaurant, and uh, it's true he did work as a dishwasher in a restaurant called Ruby Chow's, and the owner was a woman by the name of Ruby Chow. And on screen, she's played by Nancy Kwan, who is a famous Hong Kong actress who was also a personal friend of Bruce Lee. So it was nice to see a, a, a personal friend of Bruce Lee play a character in the movie. That's the best part of that scene. Actually, Bruce came to America and Ruby Chow's uh, husband was friends with Bruce's father. That's how he got a job in the restaurant. They put him up there. But Bruce actually, because his father and the owner's husband were friends, thought he was just going to live there. He didn't realize he was going to have to do scut work. <laughs> And so he was furious that he had to do the worst jobs in the restaurant, dishwashing, cleaning up, and that they treated him like a servant because he actually came from a well-to-do family in Hong Kong and he never had to do, he had servants in Hong Kong. So he never had to do any of this kind of work. And so he would complain loudly that he was being treated like an indentured servant. And all the other cooks were annoyed by this because they didn't come from this kind of rich background and they thought he was a snotty little brat. And so there were a couple times where he said something and apparently once one of the cooks picked up a knife and threatened him and Bruce said, come on, come get me. And then it ended there. So they took that moment, which is true, which is Bruce shot his mouth off and somebody challenged him with a butcher's knife and then they turned it into a whole fight scene. In the alley behind the restaurant and this whole whole fight scene there. <laughs> Exactly. And that's actually one of the things Bruce Lee's life has been turned into many different sort of projects. And they inevitably try to turn his life into a kung fu movie. And that's one of the problems is like you want to turn it into a genre kung fu movie. So you take things that are kind of true and then you turn it into these big fight scenes. Oh, you have to find somewhere in there to, to throw in those fight scenes to keep the action in the movie because people are expecting it at that point. Exactly. So they have this genre constriction that they're forced into. And so they try to bend the biography to the genre. In the movie, we never, to my recollection, I don't remember seeing or uh, hearing any dialogue necessarily about where Bruce goes to get an education after this. We see him on some sort of a college campus. And then there's another another fight here. It happens with somebody named Joe Henderson. Bruce is working out in the gym one day and, and Joe comes in. He spurts some racist remarks and, and picks a fight with Bruce. Bruce, again, pretty easily defeats Joe and the three other guys that he's with. He's always outnumbered in these fights. After the fight, a couple of the guys come up to him and ask, can you teach me how to fight? I want to learn, learn what you did. A little bit later, we see... Linda Emery, she enters the movie as the only woman in Bruce's class. That's how the movie sets up that he goes from, basically he was a dishwasher and then he goes to get an education and then he starts teaching and then of course meeting Linda. So how accurate was that where he went from not teaching <laughs> to teaching his, his martial arts to then meeting Linda? Was she one of the first students that he had in the U.S.? No. Um, so <laughs> they, again, they play with the time frame. So what happened was when he first got to America, he was already intent on going to college. They signed him up for a, essentially a remedial or vocational high school to get his high school diploma because he hadn't graduated from high school in Hong Kong. So he went to this high school for older students, vocational education. And in his class was a man, African-American by the name of Jesse Glover who later shows up in the movie as his kind of best buddy. He actually is the first student of Bruce Lee. And he had wanted to learn Kung Fu, but other Chinese teachers wouldn't teach him. And he heard that Bruce Lee knew it. And so he befriended Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee actually didn't really want to teach him that much, but because no one else, he didn't have anything else to do but washing dishes. Jesse Glover became his first student. Jesse loved him. He thought he was great. So Jesse told his roommate, who became Bruce Lee's second student. And then they told a couple other friends and they became Bruce Lee's third and fourth student. And then Bruce started doing things like going and giving demonstrations at high schools to gain more students. And at these demonstrations, he would invite a tough guy in the crowd up on stage and say, hey, try to hit me. And they would try to hit him and he would block all their punches and tie them up in knots. And then those people would become his students. So they took that and turned that into a fight scene on the college campus. But before he got to college and he went to the University of Washington, 
he had already had about 10 or 15 students who were also best friends and they trained in parks, et cetera. And then he opened a school his first year when he was at the University of Washington and he had a school running and one of Linda's friends, female friends, was one of his students. And she told him about Bruce Lee. And that's how she became one of his students. But she she did eventually become one of his students there, but she introduced through one of her friends. That's right. Okay. So that's absolutely true. And they she was one of his students and he started to take a shine to her. And she was sort of gaga for him from the very beginning. And that's how they ended up dating. Okay. So then that leads into the next part, because in the movie we see when once they start dating, the movie very heavily implies that it was Linda's idea for Bruce to actually start his own school, not just students, but have his own school. We see like a, a rundown building that Bruce is going to fix up. And you see on the, the glass pane of the door, it says it's the Jun Fan Gung Fu Institute. Was it Linda's idea for Bruce to start a school? I'm assuming not in San Francisco, but perhaps in Washington? No, it wasn't her idea. <laughs> so one thing you have to know is how this movie came about, which is Linda Lee ran the Bruce Lee estate and Universal Pictures bought all the rights to Bruce Lee from her as part of an overall deal. So the movie rights, the TV rights, the game, video game rights, the image rights, and also her book in order to turn it into this movie because they were going to make Bruce Lee part of, you know, like Spider-Man, one of their franchises. And so because it's based on her book, this is really her story of who Bruce Lee was. And it's from their perspective, which is why this is kind of a romance because this is Linda's version of Bruce Lee, how she met him, how it did. And of course, and with Hollywood magic, they make her sort of a, you know, a kind of feminist in the 1990s model as opposed to what she was, which was like kind of an Eisenhower girl who was very strong, but quiet. And so, you know, Lauren Holly, who's beautiful, plays her as this kind of spunky thing, but actually Linda was much quieter as a person. Bruce Lee already had opened a school. She went to the school that he had opened and he already had the idea of making it like McDonald's, like a franchise across the country. Ah, okay. Yeah. Cause that's something that she mentions too. The McDonald's key there of franchising it. Yeah. 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 So they gave that to her to make her sort of a stronger female lead, basically. Okay. Okay. Well, once he starts the school, this leads back to something that you had talked about earlier. Bruce, he gets in trouble for teaching what they call guelo or Westerners. We never really find out who they are really, but the other That's right. Chinese martial arts teachers around just he goes into some room and you know they're around a table. Ma Dang, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're they're playing around a table and and oh, you can't teach non Chinese our ways. The Guaylo. <laughs> yeah. I think the movie just calls them the elders. Yeah. You know, and they're gonna enforce this rule. And the way they're going to enforce it is by pitting Bruce Lee against who we presume is their fighting champion, uh, Johnny Sun. And in this fight, Bruce beats Johnny. But then at the very last moment, just as Bruce is walking away, Johnny has kind of a cheap shot. He kicks Bruce in the back, breaking his back and sending Bruce to the hospital. <laughs> That's right. That's how the movie sets this up. Did this fight with Johnny Sun actually happen because Bruce Lee wanted to teach anyone who wanted to learn? Yeah. So again, this is one of those, this is one of the great myths of Bruce Lee that this is why this happened. The fight did happen. It is one of the most famous Kung Fu fights ever. The real story is that Bruce Lee was opening a school in Oakland. He had one in Seattle and he, this was going to be a second part of his franchise, part of his great empire, McDonald's Kung Fu empire that he was going to build. And he was having trouble getting students to Oakland because all the Kung Fu students were in San Francisco because that had the largest Chinatown. Now, there were people who knew that he was teaching white people, and there were people who didn't think it was a good idea, Chinese people at that time. For example, Ruby Chow told him not to do it. But they, there was no elders. There, the Chinatown didn't have a system of elders who enforced their laws. There were just people who, like, you know, between each other were saying, that's really stupid, you shouldn't teach Guai Lo. What actually happened was he was giving a performance in San Francisco at a Chinese theater with a large crowd, and he was demonstrating his version of Kung Fu, Wing Chun, his style. And while giving the demonstration, he said, my style is better than everybody else's style. And he also said, 
you've got a lot of old masters. These old tigers have no teeth, basically, that their styles are useless and mine's the best, so you should come study with me. Now, every martial artist thinks his style is the best, but you're not supposed to say it out loud because it gets people pissed off. (laughs) And that's what happened. They got pissed off. And so there were a couple young 20-something kids who were mad that Bruce Lee had said this. And so they started talking amongst themselves and they got this waiter who also studied Kung Fu and wanted to open his own school by the name of Wong Jack Man to challenge, formally challenge Bruce Lee. And so they went over and they challenged him and Bruce Lee said, yeah, I'll fight him, but you have to fight me at my school. Another thing the movie gets wrong. And so they went over to his school. And by the way, when they went over to his school, his wife was there. His friend was there. He didn't sneak off and have this fight. And he won the fight fairly quickly. It was within three minutes. At the end of the fight, though, he beats up the he beat up Wong Jack Man. Wong Jack Man didn't break his back. That that's a total fantasy. <laughs> what happened was later, many like four or five years later, Bruce Lee was doing an exercise. He hadn't warmed up for it, where he's picking dead weight off the ground, and he strained his back. So he did have a back injury. They just collapsed the time frame. And then they had Wong Jack Man sneakily break his back at the end of a fight that he lost. And so they're combining several elements in order to sort of make the story more exciting. Okay, so that that's a common technique that a lot of movies do to compress a timeline of an entire lifetime into just, you know, an hour, hour and a half or so. Yep. I should say, though, that when Wong Jack Man saw the movie, he was so furious that he sued Linda Lee and Universal Studios for two million dollars. <laughs> Oh, wow. (laughs) So that went to court and the court ruled that he was somewhat of a public figure. So they threw it out. But he became a very respected uh, martial arts instructor in San Francisco. And for his whole career, he became the guy who broke Bruce Lee's back (laughs) sneakily in a fight. Oh, wow. And so his, his students hate this movie and they hate Bruce Lee. So this has become a lot like within this little world, this is like a really contentious issue. What actually happened at that fight? Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds uh, very, very different. Yes, yes. Okay, so as far as the movie is concerned, and it sounds like he did have some sort of a back strain, not necessarily a a broken back. Right. But there's a montage in the movie where Bruce is in rehabilitation, and as he's in rehabilitation, he, he can barely move, and he dictates this idea of a new form of martial arts to Linda. And this is where we get Jeet Kune Do. Linda's taking notes, sketches. We see her typing it out on a typewriter. I I paused the movie to see the title of it, just called The Book. And we know from history that, of course, Bruce Lee really did write a book. But the publication date on that, I looked, was in 1975, after Bruce Lee's death. And we see a scene in the movie where Linda's so excited. She comes and you can see the book is, you know, oh, your book's your book's here. So how accurate is the movie in depicting this montage of how Bruce Lee came up with Jeet Kune Do by dictating it to Linda while he was in rehabilitation? Yeah. So again, time frame and compression. They tried to get all of this into a very tight space. Bruce Lee came up with the idea of Jeet Kune Do in 1967, 1968, and his injury wasn't until 1969. So he had already had the idea himself, and he'd been working on it for Actually, the Wong Jack Man fight, when it ended, that's true. He was upset by how it did, and that led to his break with Wing Chun and his desire to form a a new style. So for maybe three to four years, he had already been taking notes about Jeet Kune Do, and he had the name for it, and he had already started teaching it before he had his injury. That said, Linda Lee was extraordinarily helpful to his career. She supported him all the way. She was one of his students. She was a pretty good martial artist. So they're giving her a little more credit or specific credit than she deserves for this. But she was very much part of his life. And I think what's interesting, people should know, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do is the best-selling martial arts book of all time. I've written three. It's none of them have sold anywhere near what that has. So all respect. But basically what happened is they went through and they found a box full of notebooks. And they just took those notebooks and spliced them together. And that's the book after he died. So he never finished the book. He didn't write it. It's not, if you look at it, it's not actually a a book. It's just a series of notes and sayings 
that he scribbled through like, you know, eight notebooks as you do when you're prepping to try to write something, but he never got around to the actual writing of it. He just got to the research phase. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Again, that's a very different picture than him dictating it all and and having it all typed out and and published and received back in his lifetime. Okay. So I'm assuming based on what you had had said before, because after this, we see Bruce Lee go proving his new fighting style. And he does this going to, I don't remember if it was a high school auditorium or where it was, but he goes to this auditorium. He's like, pretty much pick out the I'll fight anybody in this room and prove that my style is better. And you mentioned something earlier similar to that. Right. Of course, the movie uses this as an example of bringing Johnny Sun back, and he defeats him in under 60 seconds. I'm assuming that particular instance didn't happen. (laughs) No. No, so from the moment he opened his first school, he would go give demonstrations. And what I think is interesting about that is that's how he created the Bruce Lee character that we see on screen is he did it essentially like a stand-up comic, working his material. He would go on stage and give demonstrations of what his style was, and he would tell jokes, and he would be funny, but he'd also be serious, and he'd invite somebody up. And he got to see from the crowds what worked and what didn't. And he invented himself as Bruce Lee, the Kung Fu master, on the sort of small stages of Seattle, Oakland, and L.A., And so when you understand who Bruce Lee was, you understand somebody who had honed this persona, which was part him, of course, like any stand-up, but was also a reaction to the crowd. He knew what worked because he'd tested it. So he did go around and give these demonstrations, but he never, he was always in control and it was always like, I uh, throw a punch, I'll block it. It never turned into a full fight. He did have a few fights with people who didn't like him. Uh, there was a Japanese master, not master, a Japanese karate student. He fought and beat in like 20 seconds. So Bruce Lee was a real fighter and he could fight, but he never fought the Jack Soon, Wong Jack Man guy ever again. The guy who didn't actually break his back. So, and that scene leads up to him, his discovery in Hollywood, right? What actually happened was he gave a performance in Long Beach outside of L.A., And there was a hairdresser there uh, who was a famous Hollywood hairdresser by the name of Jay Sebring. And he saw the performance and was impressed by Bruce Lee. And then Jay Sebring had a TV executive who was one of his clients talking about a new TV series he wanted to do with a Chinese actor who could do action. And so Jay Sebring put the TV producer together with Bruce Lee. So one of his demonstrations did lead to his Hollywood career, but it wasn't a 60-second fight to the death with someone. Okay, yeah. I think it was uh, Bill Krieger. Yes. Happened to be watching one of the performances. He's, oh, hey, can you do this stuff in front of the camera? I've got a show called The Green Hornet. Let's, let's do this. That's pretty much how the movie shows his transition from martial arts to acting. When he made that transition to acting, what happened to his school's Did he put that chapter of his life behind him and shift over to acting? The movie kind of seems to imply that he did. He actually, after he got offered the role of Cato in The Green Hornet, he opened a school in Los Angeles. He did close his Oakland school because it didn't have enough students. And then he had a friend running his Seattle school. So for the early parts of his Hollywood career, he basically still had two schools going. He did spend a fair amount of time initially with his Los Angeles school, his L.A.-based school, and taught some of the students there. And that was, he sort of had a bifurcated life. He had his Hollywood life, and he still kept up his students. But eventually, by the time he becomes world famous, he closed all of his schools down. Yeah, that's a lot of different irons in the fire to keep going, especially spread across the different locations. That's right. Now, there's one scene I want to ask you about because there's... Bruce Lee, he started his acting career, and we see a scene where he's walking with Bill Krieger, and the two of them are coming up with an idea for a new show. They're talking back and forth, and as they're doing that from the dialogue, we start to get this idea that starts to take shape. It'll, it'll be a Western starring a Chinese immigrant. Uh, he's searching for his brother, uh, except he doesn't use a gun. He uses Kung Fu, and they're both just excited about this show. And then later, we see Bruce and Linda sitting at home watching a new TV show called Kung Fu starring David Carradine. 
you can just see that Bruce feels betrayed. So that's how the movie sets up this idea that Bruce Lee and Bill Krieger came up with this idea for the show. And then it very heavily implies that David Carradine was cast over Bruce Lee for the lead role. Did that happen? So no, again, this is one of the most annoying myths that continue to this day based on this movie. So the TV series Kung Fu was written by uh, two Jewish comedy writers from Brooklyn by the name of Ed Spielman and Howard Friedlander. They came up with the original idea. They sold it to uh, Warner Brothers. And the producer was Fred Weintraub, who is the Bill Krieger character. So he had this idea. He went to Bruce Lee and said, I have this idea. I hear, you know, you Ben Cato. What do you think about playing the lead? And then the idea as a movie died and later got revived as a TV series. It was originally supposed to be a feature movie. And so it got revived as a TV series. But by this time, it was 1971, and Bruce Lee had already gone back to Hong Kong and made The Big Boss. And so after he finished The Big Boss, he flew to Hollywood and auditioned for the role. And the TV producer in charge decided probably didn't want to cast an Asian guy anyway. But he felt that Bruce Lee's accent was too thick. And so the role went to David Carradine. So this wasn't his idea. He didn't write the script. He auditioned for the role and didn't get it. There may have been some racism why he didn't get it, but he didn't leave Hollywood because of it. He'd already left Hollywood and gone to Hong Kong. So all of this is mixed up and it's, it becomes this huge myth, which everyone tells, which is Hollywood was so racist, Bruce Lee had to leave because they gave Kung Fu to David Carradine and go to Hong Kong. And that it just doesn't fit the chronology. Hollywood was racist. He did face racism, but this wasn't the example that drove him to Hong Kong. What was his reason for going to Hong Kong then? He was really frustrated with the fact that he couldn't get roles and the roles he was offered were really stereotypical, terrible roles, which you can imagine at that time. He got offered a two movie deal by a man named Raymond Chow, who had started Golden Harvest Studios, which was this upstart studio. And initially, Bruce blew him off because he still thought his Hollywood career was going to come to fruition. And then after a couple years of it not going well, he changed his mind and signed the deal. But as soon as he signed the deal, he got this role in Longstreet, which did really well. And so he felt like Hollywood was going to work out for him, but he needed the money. He had bought a house in Brentwood that was too expensive for him. And he'd also bought a Porsche because his student, Steve McQueen, had a Porsche and he wanted to be cool like the other cool kids. He basically was out of money. And so he agreed to go to Hong Kong and he planned on going for like two or three months and filming these two movies, getting a cash infusion. And then he was going to go back to Hollywood and continue his TV career, which right before he left looked like it was very promising. So, and that's like a confusing storyline, and that's why they simplify it and make it just a simple racism story. Yeah, I think there's little hints as you're you're talking there. There's little hints of those types of things. There was, I think, one scene where we see Linda looking at some past due notices, yep, giving the impression that they need the money. And there's a, a scene I think where where Bruce has a I don't know if it was a Porsche. I didn't look. I don't remember specifically, but it was a pretty nice car. That he was he was driving around in. <laughs> yeah, it is. And she gets that she when he pulls up in it, she gives him a look like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which leads into a, an, another aspect of it because the implication I got from from that side was they may have had financial troubles, but maybe Bruce didn't really know about that. I guess the impression I got was that Linda Linda knew about it. She kept track of the finances, but. Bruce went off and bought this expensive car and when they when they need the money. Was that kind of that dynamic between the two of them? Uh, no. Uh, he knew about all the financial difficulties. There's letters where he sends home. He sends letters. He had to borrow money from friends. And so he was like writing letters saying, I'll get you your money now. Or I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm late with the money. So uh, no. But one thing that did happen was when it, it, right at this period when he had the house that was too expensive and the Porsche, that's when he injured his back and he couldn't work for six months. And he was making his money teaching martial arts to Hollywood stars like Steve McQueen. 
who were paying him the equivalent of $1,000 an hour. And he could no longer teach them. And that's when their financial difficulty got much worse. And so Linda had to take a job, which she had never done before because it was very 1950s. She looked after the kids. He brought in the money. And so she did have to support the family during his period of convalescence. Um, So I don't want to in any way underplay her importance to Bruce Lee's success. It's just they they polish it up and turn it kind of 1990s version. Okay. Well, that touches on something else I want to ask you about, and that is the overall way that Bruce is portrayed in the movie as a family man. In the movie, we see Bruce Lee. It seems like he, you know, he loves Linda and his two kids. He's a workaholic, but it looks like throughout the movie, he's really just trying his best to provide for his family. Toward the end of the movie, he says something along the lines of, I just want to spend more time with my kids and stop breaking my wife's heart because, you know, I'm, I'm working all the time. What was the Lee family dynamic like? In certain ways, that's very true, which is he did love his wife. They were great friends. He adored his children and he was a workaholic. But he was also a Hollywood actor in the era of free love. (laughs) And his friends were like Steve McQueen. And so he had little things on the side here and there. Um, that no one ever reported before I wrote my biography about him. For him, he didn't, I, I, it was just that, you know, he was a Hollywood actor in the late 60s. They all cheated. And he did as well. That didn't mean he didn't love his wife. It just, he w- was doing what they all did. But the movie comes out and makes him the perfect family man. And maybe that's what a 1969 perfect family man looked like, but that's not what we think a perfect one does. And so they whitewashed his history in order to make him, you know, it was Linda's book that they turned it into. They didn't want to get into it. And, you know, what's interesting is in the original screenplay, they had a scene where he's in Thailand filming the movie and there's an actress who's hitting on him and he's awful tempted. But at the very end, he says, no, I can't because I love my wife too much. And they ended up feeling that was too racy, and they cut even that suggestion that they're a hint that he might have been tempted away from, you know, heart and home. And the truth was, he had multiple affairs over the years once he became a Hollywood actor. Okay, yeah, that's a little bit of a different dynamic than we see in the movie then. Yeah, very much. It was He was much more like Mad Men, you know, like... When you think about Mad Men, you think about these guys who love their wives, came home and whatever. But when they were off at work, they did they had sex with the secretary or whatever, and it just didn't interfere. And that's that double standard was what he grew up with. And so it's just a different dynamic than those of us who grew up kind of post 80s, where that's just not acceptable. Yeah. OK, well, that's a good way to phrase that in another TV show example. <laughs> another theme throughout the movie that I wanted to ask you about was this concept we see of the demon. It starts at the very beginning, right? The very beginning of the movie when Bruce is a child, all the way to what I thought was a very specific date, the 32nd day of shooting Enter the Dragon near the end of the film. And then it's during that last vision that Bruce sees his own grave. And on the grave is the date July 20th, 1973. Can you give a little more insight into the historical accuracy of this idea of the demon that Bruce Lee, if he's hallucinating or how he's seeing these visions in the movie, but then how well did the movie do depicting the end of Bruce Lee's life? Again, they took some element of truth and then they ran with it, which is before Bruce was born, the first male child that his parents had did die. I think before it was one year old and in Chinese culture, that's considered a bad omen. And so it's a kind of superstition. Any child, any male child born after that is supposed to be given a female nickname uh, and dressed up in female clothes. And so they did do that with Bruce Lee. In fact, they even pierced his ear and gave him an earring when he was a a little baby. And so this is a, a Chinese custom from that period of time, but that's it. Like that's, that's the end of the demon. (laughs) He never, he never came up again. Bruce Lee never had visions of a demon. His father never warned him that the demon was going to get him. So he would have to run off to America. Bruce probably had some bad dreams every once in a while, but it wasn't of a demon. 
the director has been interviewed and he said, I wanted to, you know, use that artistic license to speak about his inner struggle. But they also had another problem, which is how to deal with Bruce Lee's death. And Bruce Lee died in another woman's bedroom. That's how we know that he wasn't a, a purely faithful husband. When that came out, it was a huge scandal in the Hong Kong press. And it was very tough on Linda. And so one of the things that she wanted to make sure in the years since is that no one really dug into the situation involving Bruce Lee's death. And so any Bruce Lee estate product, any anything that comes f- that's associated with the Bruce Lee estate, pretty much avoids the gritty details of his death. And so using the demon was another way for them to kind of skittle by what actually happened, which was he was spending the afternoon with his mistress. And for some reasons that are still under debate, he ended up dying in her bedroom. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I could, I could see that then because that would go against the family man that they set up throughout the entire movie. Yep. I mean, this is really the version they're doing is Bruce Lee, the family man, but also the romance. And I think they do a wonderful job of getting that part of it. But he was a more complicated person with more flaws, and they just decided to, you know, scrub those away. And the death obviously would make that much more complicated storyline. So him dying in that sort of mi- almost mythical way is a way for them to escape that. But you know, one of the things that was spooky about the movie is that they had asked Brandon Lee if he wanted to play his father, Brandon being Bruce's son, and he said no. He took the part in The Crow. And that last scene, Bruce is fighting the demon, and then the demon goes after his son. And Bruce has to kill the demon in order to protect his son. And within a year, Brandon had died, actually six months, I think, um, had died on the set of The Crow under like really weird circumstances. That was like a blank or something like that, wasn't it? That don't remember the specifics of it, but I remember when that happened, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very creepy. And so this movie came out, And it's got this whole demon thing about a family curse. And then Brandon dies. And so in the public's mind, there is this idea that somehow Bruce's family has actually been cursed. I've actually had producers in Hollywood call me and say, we're doing the curse of the Lee family. Will you participate in that? And I'm like, no, I won't. Um, Because there's no curse on his family, but they've had two really tragic deaths, the father and the son. And part of the reason people believe this is because, unfortunately, they use this demon sort of mythos in the movie itself. Well, we've talked about some of the big myths that come out of the movie. Are there any other major myths about Bruce Lee that people believe because of Dragon, the Bruce Lee story? I think we hit the main ones. I was rewatching it this afternoon and he never drove a motorcycle. (laughs) (laughs) That's not a big myth, but it is funny because... All of his friends said he was a terrible driver. Like he was, he was like, uh, he drove too fast. He scared the heck out of them. So the, the idea of him on a motorcycle is kind of foolish. I think the biggest myth that the movie sets up, which is because they start with him training with Ip Man, they make it seem as if he was a martial artist who accidentally became an actor. Everything up to this moment where he's fighting Jack's son, he's just this martial artist. And then accidentally Hollywood discovers him. Actually, Bruce Lee's father was a famous opera singer, which they mentioned in the movie. But Bruce Lee was also a child actor and appeared in 20 Cantonese movies before the age of 18. He was kind of like the Macaulay Culkin of Hong Kong. And so when Hollywood called, he was ready. Like He, he already knew how to act. And that's why he succeeded, because he was a great martial artist who also had a strong background in acting. And most martial artists who get cast, like Chuck Norris, don't know how to act. Bruce Lee is the only one who could do both. And that's why he succeeded as a star, because he was an actor. And then he became a martial artist, and then he combined the two. And this movie sets up the idea of Bruce Lee, the pure martial arts genius, perfect father, And he's actually like an actor who became a martial artist who was not perfect, but combined those two skills. And I think if they had just had one scene where they showed him as a child actor, it would have filled out his story much more. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering, just as you're saying that, it lends back to what something that you mentioned earlier, where he 
thrown into, well, this has to be a Kung Fu movie because it's about Bruce Lee. And so if he was an actor, would he know how to fight the four cooks in the alleyway and, you know, the, the sailors and, you know, all these scenes that we have to set up for him? Well, he has to be a martial artist then at that point because he has to already know how to fight. And so I'm wondering if that's why they did that in order to tell the story, but <laughs> mix up quite a few things along the way to do that. <laughs> I th- yeah, you know, that's part of the issue. And all to be fair, I've seen much worse biopics than this one. <laughs> like uh, As biopics go, it's a perfectly decent version. Huge a- inaccuracies, but that's sort of part and parcel. Part of the reason, though, is I think this it's based on Linda Lee's book. And for her, she fell in love with Bruce Lee when he was a martial artist. And she fell in love with her martial arts teacher. And I think for her, that's the most important aspect of him. And I don't believe she was ever particularly happy with him when he went back to being an actor. Do you think some of the affairs had something to do with that? I mean, that's part of that lifestyle. I think the lifestyle, yeah. After he died, very interestingly, she never, she pulled away from it. She kept her kids away from it. She didn't want her son to be an actor. She was a quiet person who never caught into that world. And I think this was Bruce Lee's dream to be a great star. Her dream was to marry a guy who had the McDonald's chain of Kung Fu Studios. And so I think those two aspects of Bruce Lee, what's interesting is when you hear her versions of the story, She recognizes he was both, but she emphasizes the part that she fell in love with. And this movie does as well. And that's created this image of Bruce Lee as this kung fu master and sort of accidental actor when it's actually the opposite. That makes sense. Now, if you put yourself in the director's chair for a moment, if there was one thing you wish that was in the movie that didn't put in there, what would that be? It would help if they just showed, I think Jason Scott Lee did a good job of catching Bruce's emotional range, like his charm and his anger, but they should have showed his flaws and they should have had one scene where he was not the perfect husband. They should have one affair because I think that would have shown a more complex adult version of him and allowed us to appreciate the fact that he was a flawed human being who was also able to achieve greatness. And that would have made it less a child's story and more an adult story. And every time someone, you know, there's recently been a documentary that came out, ESPN's doing, and again, they skip the death, they skip the affairs, and they focus on Bruce Lee's accomplishments only, and they turn him into a saint and almost a demigod. And I really think it's important for us to appreciate him as a human being because as a flawed human being, his successes are more impressive. But if you treat him as a demigod, then, you know, of course, he could beat 50 people from the get go. He never lost a fight. He was perfect. I don't know why we feel the need to treat Bruce Lee as perfect. We have movies about other iconic figures where, you know, Martin Luther King had affairs like it's not these aren't things that we can't deal with as a culture. So that's the thing that annoys me about these films in general, which is this desire to make Bruce Lee a saint. He wasn't a saint. He was a great man, but he wasn't a saint. We're all human and we all make mistakes and there are going to perhaps be different mistakes than the ones that that he made. But that would make for a lot more a lot more character depth there and a lot more relatability to it. I think so. So I'm hopeful that someday they will do a more human version of Bruce Lee on screen. I feel like this was a kind of the kids starter version of the Bruce Lee story where they mix a bunch of stuff up. And unfortunately, no one else has corrected it. And so when I wrote the biography, I felt in many ways, I felt like this movie was the thing I was writing against (laughs) because there were so many things that were wrong that I didn't know when I started because the movie's been reinforced by magazine articles, et cetera. And so while it's a perfectly fine movie, it is pretty terrible history. Well, you mentioned your biography and hopefully at the end of the day, everybody listening to this realizes that it is a movie. It's going to be a movie. It's not going to be historically accurate. So with that in mind, anyone listening to this that wants to learn the true story, can you share some information about your book and where they can get a copy? So the title of the book is Bruce Lee, A Life by Matthew Polly. It's available everywhere. So you can get it on Amazon. It's in most bookstores still. Paperback versions come out. It's being adapted into a documentary. It may be a movie someday. We're working on that. So Who knows, maybe we will get the story straight in Hollywood. But until that day, 
the books there and it's uh, available everywhere. <laughs> Thank you again so much for your time, Matthew. I really appreciate it. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. I'd like to thank Matthew Pauly for his time and expertise in helping us separate fact from fiction in the movie Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. If you want to learn more about Bruce Lee, go get a copy of Matthew's awesome book called Bruce Lee, A Life. And of course, if you're driving or unable to head there right now, then I'll make sure to add a link to Matthew's book, both in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Bruce Lee was born in the United States. Number two, Bruce Lee did not dictate his book on Jeet Kune Do to his wife, Linda. Number three, Bruce Lee left Hollywood because of the racism he faced when he was passed over for a TV show called Kung Fu that he helped write. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Bruce Lee was born in the United States. That is true. As Matthew explained, the movie was correct to mention that Bruce's father toured the United States as a part of the Cantonese Opera Company. So, Bruce was born in the United States during one of those tours. However, the movie was incorrect in showing that Bruce didn't know about his being born in the United States until his dad showed him the birth certificate one day. Next is number two. Bruce Lee did not dictate his book on Jeet Kune Do to his wife, Linda. That is true. And by that, I mean it is true that Bruce Lee did not dictate the book to Linda. Even though the movie shows a copy of Bruce Lee's book arriving at their house, Matthew explained that Bruce Lee's book was not published in his lifetime like the movie shows, and it wasn't even completed in his lifetime. In fact, the book wasn't a completed book as much as it was a collection of the notes and research that Bruce had jotted down about his fighting style. That means the lie is number three. Bruce Lee left Hollywood because of the racism he faced when he was passed over for a TV show called Kung Fu that he helped write. Matthew explained that this is one of the major myths that comes from the movie, and that's the idea that David Carradine was cast in the lead role for the TV show Kung Fu over Bruce Lee, when it was Bruce Lee who came up with the idea for the whole show. Well, as Matthew shared, Bruce Lee did not come up with the idea for the show at all. It was written by two comedians in Brooklyn. What really happened was that Bruce Lee was offered the lead role of a movie version of Kung Fu, but the movie version fell through. And by the time that story came back around as a TV show, they were going to, instead of doing a movie, they were going to do it as a TV show. Bruce Lee was already in Hong Kong for a movie called The Big Boss. Now, Bruce Lee did fly back to Hollywood to audition for the role in the TV show, and the director felt his accent was too thick. So he didn't get the role. So yes, it is possible that there was some racism for why he didn't get that role. But Matthew pointed out that Bruce did, in fact, face some racism in Hollywood. So it's a very real thing that was going on. But the movie is incorrect to show that Bruce had a part in coming up with the idea for the show Kung Fu and then left Hollywood because he didn't get the role. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. I know that's not something that most podcasts do, and that is exactly why I'm sharing this information. If there's one thing that is surprising to most people who are new to podcasting or have never created a podcast before, it's just how much time goes into creating them. So I figure maybe if you find out a little bit more about how much time and money and effort goes into creating a podcast like mine, then maybe you'll start to appreciate all the other podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 28 hours to create and cost $27.13 in out-of-pocket expenses. And as I always do, I want to make it clear that that time 
time and cost is only my time for this one episode. So that does not include the countless hours of my guest time researching the subject matter that we talked about, nor does it include any of my ongoing costs. For example, based on a true story podcast.com, right there you have the domain name has a cost, the website hosting has a cost, the uh, it's running a WordPress, which is free, but there's plugins, the theme is not free. All of these things cost money. The software that I'm recording this into, the hardware, the microphone, all of these things cost money. And that does not, that uh, $27.13 for this episode does not include any of that. So it also, oh, and it also doesn't include the time. So this episode took 28 hours. That was just producing this one episode. It doesn't include maintaining the website, uh, updating things. I actually just ran through an update on my computer that uh, took a little little time to update some software on the computer. So it doesn't include any time like that. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a bonus, you'll get access to hours of exclusive content on the producer's feed. Right now, there are 43 minisodes covering a different fictional movie and the way that they use real history or events to make them seem more realistic. For example, in our last two minisodes, we looked at where some of the fairy tales from the movie Shrek came from. And we also got to hear the original story for one of those fairy tales, Snow White. There are hours and hours of bonus content available immediately and plenty more planned and in the works as just a way of saying thank you for helping me keep the lights on here at Based on a True Story. Once again, you can find out how to support the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. In the meantime, if you'd like to add to the story, hop onto the Based on a True Story Facebook group or you can reach out to me directly on Twitter where I'm at Dan Lefeb. That's D-A-N. L-E-F-E-B. And if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.